It is one of my favorite refrains of a song as it reminds us of that wonderful truth that one day Jesus is coming again. Let me invite you to take your Bible, please, tonight. Let's open to the book of Job this evening. The book of Job, as we continue to make our way through a series that we have entitled God's Waiting Room. All of us at some point or time in our life are going to have to face the times of trial where God will ask us to endure through the difference or cause us to endure through the time as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, a time of affliction. The difference between victory and defeat is how you and I respond in the midst of of that time of trial. There are not one of us here that will go through life in a static response. We will all be responding to the events that are placed before us. The question is, are we going to allow the Word of God and the power of the Gospel to shape our thinking in the times of our trials? Or will there be a gap between what we profess to believe about God and His promises, and the actual decisions and responses that we make when we're faced with a time of trial. I'm grateful that when we come to the Word of God, we find that which we need to help us to endure and live and respond in a way that truly brings blessing and glory to God and causes others to see what a life of godliness, even in the times of trial, will look like. In the book, How People Change, authors Lane and Tripp express a point of comfort for all of us in the time of hardship. On page 96, the authors make this statement, the Bible does not offer to us a sanitized version of life. When you and I come to the Word of God and we study it, there are for us examples of men and women in the Bible who go through the difficult times of life. And when we turn to the book of Job this morning, we recognize this evening we find a study of a man and the problems and the difficulties and the trials of his life. Job responds well in the times of trials, but he's not perfect. There are things that Job will have to learn and discover in this time through his life. Sometimes you and I get a viewpoint that the people perhaps that God records for us in scriptures had it easier than we do. They responded better, but the reality is they, just like you and me, were men tempted in all points like as we are. And the struggle is that we need to learn how from those stories to be able to live in this world that we might live in a way that is pleasing to God. And again, perhaps no greater story of that is found than the story of the life of Job. Tonight I want us to look at from Job 1 and 2 what I simply termed the drama of life. I'm going to read some of the verses together for us. I'll announce which ones I'm reading. I'm not going to read both chapters, but just some selected verses from it tonight. Begin with me, if you would, in verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And the man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now come down to verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered... My servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. 
Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now if you would, jump over with me in verse 20. After we read of the calamity of Job's life, Then Job arose and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job said not, nor charge God foolishly. Chapter 2. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, How thou consider my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath he will give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Bow with me, please, in prayer. Our Father, we come before you tonight, grateful again that your word gives to us all that we need for life and godliness, even in the times of the trials and the tribulations of our life. Lord, we ask and pray that as we survey the drama of Job's life tonight, as we consider the main characters of the cast and their part in the drama of Job's life, that, Lord, you would give us understanding. For all of us also have, at times, the drama of life to face. The trials, the tribulations, the heartaches, the hardships. And Lord, we must, like Job, live in such of a way that still we bring honor and glory to our God. Not to flee, not to run, not to charge God foolishly, but instead to live by faith, to walk by faith even when our sight and the version of life that we see is blurred or hard. But may we by faith follow Him. So Lord, we ask and pray Your blessing upon our time tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Anytime there are calamities, anytime there are struggles, whether those be individual struggles whether that be something that comes into your family's life, whether that be a prolonged sickness, whether it be a financial stress, or whether it be national calamities, as we have seen in recent months within our own nation. The question is often asked, why does God allow suffering? Sometimes individuals look at the suffering of the world and they see the suffering of mankind and because of that they conclude God cannot truly be a loving God or they conclude there cannot be a God because God would not allow suffering. 
And if you say as a believer that God allows it for good, how can you and I defend such a statement? At the heart of the question is really a deeper question that man once answered, and that is simply this. What's the role that God plays in the suffering of mankind? And so the reality is when we come to the life of Job, we find a remarkable event that is recorded for you and for me. There are only a few passages like this within all of Scripture, with the one in Job being perhaps the most personal of them all. What takes place in Job 1 and 2 is God, in essence, opens the windows of heaven. He pulls back the curtains of heaven and allows you and I to see the inner workings of what takes place within the throne room of the King of Kings. The other passages that are similar to this in the life of Job, is found, one is found in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah is given the vision of the throne room of God, and he sees God in all His glory sitting upon the throne. He sees the cherubim flying about, each having their six wings. With twain, they cover their feet. With twain, they cover their face. With tw twain, they do fly, and they cry about the throne of God, Holy, Holy, Holy. And Isaiah is overwhelmed with such a vision of the throne room of God. And then he hears the question, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And all that he can do is respond, Here am I, send me. What a beautiful image. What a beautiful picture is given. In Isaiah chapter 14, it is revealed to us, what took place in heaven when sin entered into the universe with the fall of Lucifer as he leads a rebellion against God. Perhaps the most beautiful creature that God had made, a musical being. He was to lead the worship of heaven, and yet the reality is he was lifted up in pride and said, I will exalt my throne above God. I will rule and reign in His stead. I want to be worshipped. I want to be adored. I want to receive what only belongs to God. And he leads a rebellion in heaven against God. One third of the angelic host followed him. But God gives us a glimpse of what took place. On that day. In Daniel chapter 10, if you remember this from our study of the book of Daniel, Daniel is praying for an answer. And for 21 days he prayed. For 21 days he sought that answer from God. And in Daniel chapter 10, he receives a message from an angel who came to him and said, On the first day that you prayed, God sent me with the answer. And for 21 days, I've been doing battle in heaven with the forces of evil. Michael came and he released me and now I am here to give to you the answer. And so Daniel shows us the battle, the spiritual battle that takes place that goes on behind the scenes of life. But here in Job, we go behind the scenes and we see what happens during the times of our trial. And Job provides for us great comfort in the time of our trial as we understand the characters and the roles they play in the drama of your life and mine. I want you to see with me tonight as we begin the cast of characters in the drama of Job's life. You and I are trying to understand the time of trials when God brings us into the waiting room, when we are caused to endure the hardships of this life. And it's important that you and I would understand what is taking place in your life and mine. Sometimes we get very small in our view and we forget that there is something greater that is taking place in your life and in my life. And there are a cast of characters that we find, and you and I need to see that in the life of Job. And these characters require our investigation. There are those characters that Job relates to from the spiritual world, and those two main characters are going to be God 
and Satan. There are those character that Job relates to from the physical world. That being Job in his own life, his support cast, his wife, his family, and his friends. But let's take a moment to look at the main characters in this story. And let's begin, if you could, with me on Job. When we look at Job, we're going to find him in the story as the one who is the afflicted. You know Job 1 and 2 fairly well, the story that is presented to us. Job is a man that is a righteous man, one who eschewed evil, one who desired to please God in everything that he has done. Job is a wealthy man. He has been provided for by the Lord, yet in a single day and a moment of time, Job, through affliction and suffering, loses everything except his wife. I heard not that long ago someone say, you must consider the wife of Job and what a character she must have been. God didn't take her from Job. He left her there in order to inflict more agony upon him. (laughs) But when you consider Job, there's a few things that I think is helpful for us to be reminded about this man and understanding how that relates to the trial and tribulation of life. First of all, would you note with me his piety? When we come to Job chapter 1, and again in Job chapter 2, God makes a few statements about Job. He makes those statements to our enemy, the devil. Have you considered my servant Job? One who is perfect, one who is upright, one who is skewed evil. He was blameless. There was nothing that you could look at Job's life and charge him with. He was one who was without blemish. God said he is perfect. It speaks of the fact that he is one who is morally whole. This is not a man who is known for evil deeds. As God looked at his life, God defined him as perfect. Please understand, that's who's defining Job's life right now. See, sometimes you and I have the ability to cause other people to think that we're really good, we're perfect. And we may be able to fool many people around us, but God knows us perfectly, and when He looked at Job, (coughs) excuse me, He said of him, He is perfect, blameless, without blemish, morally whole. He also says of Job that he is one that is upright. The idea of that term means to be straight. He is one that does not deviate from the true way of life. He walks, we would say this way, in the straight and narrow path. He doesn't deviate to the left or the right. He stays true. He is upright. And he is one who is skewed evil. The idea of that term is that Job is one who shuns the evil way. He abandons the way of evil within this world and what they promote. He is perfect, upright. He eschews evil. That's his piety. Notice his prosperity you will look at verse 2 and it says and there was born unto him seven sons three daughters the substance also was seven thousand sheep three thousand camels five hundred yoke of oxen five hundred she asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east So when we look at Job and we consider not only his piety, we see as the Bible defines his prosperity. He is one that was fruitful. Job had the blessing of having seven sons and three daughters. In the Old Testament era, the sons were a sign of the blessing given to a man by God. At least that's how men would have viewed it. But Job is a man that was fruitful. Ten children. 
He was also one that was wealthy. His wealth is defined for us. 7,000 sheep which provided clothing and food. 3,000 camels that would provide milk as well as transportation perhaps used in trade. A thousand oxen, 500 yoke, able to plow his fields, produce fruitful crops, also for food and milk. 500 donkeys to bear the burdens, to provide transportation. And in order to have and maintain this wealth, it would require many servants and much land. He is a wealthy man who had prospered in his day. But we also find him defined as one with prominence. The Bible says that he was the greatest of men in the ease. This is not merely a reference to his wealth. It is a reference to his wisdom and respect, his integrity of life. He is a man respected by his peers, the greatest of men in the East. Job is a pious man. A prosperous man, a prominent man. But I want you to notice with me verse 4. It says, And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sacrificed, sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. That tells us of his spiritual mindset. He was the priest over his house. Job was a father praying and offering sacrifices for his children. He loved them. He cared for their souls. Yet in all these things, this man would soon face the greatest trial, the severest of tribulations. Folks, so often we look at trials and hardships and we equate them with not receiving the blessing of God. Or that we had somehow done something to deserve it. Yet God said, consider my servant Job. He's perfect. He's upright. He's a skewed evil. I've prospered him. He's prominent. He's a priest over his own house, who cares and ministers for his family. And as we consider that reality, it is this man whom God is going to allow the afflictions of life to come upon him. Folks, don't ever mistake the trials and tribulations of life as somehow the mean hand of God upon you for you not being good or perfect or upright. God allows afflictions to the best of his servants and he does so with a purpose in mind. Next, consider with me another character in all of this in our investigation and that is Satan. And in the story we find him to be the accuser. There are several things that I believe we need to understand about him. What we recognize and realize is Satan comes before God and he brings accusation really against the character of God. And because of that, God is going to allow Job to suffer affliction. And Job is going to learn something through this process He would not have learned otherwise. God is going to receive the glory. But as we look at this other individual, Satan, as we see it picked up in verse 6, several things I want you to note with me about him. Notice with me, first of all, his rank. Look at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God 
came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? When you look at Satan, we begin to recognize a few things that are helpful. Number one, he is listed among the sons of God. So it says to us that there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. He is among the sons of God. The idea of that phrase is this. Satan, although more powerful than you and I, is still one among many. He is a created being. Sometimes people get the idea or the thought that he is a God, like God, just a lesser God. He is not. He is one of the many sons of God. He is a created being. Yes, you and I were made a little lower than the angels, but he is but a fallen angel, one subordinate to God. He is coming before the Lord. He comes to present himself to he who is king, who is Lord, who is God. His rank is one of subordination. He doesn't rule over God. He is not a rival to God. He does not have the power to do as he wills. We're going to see that more in a moment. But he is one among many of the created beings of God. Yes, high in his rank, but he is not greater than our God. Notice next with me his reputation, please. He is given a title that he is referred to here, used in Job, and that is the term Satan. That word is a word that means he is an adversary. He is not the friend to mankind. Folks, can I remind you that he is the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world? Therefore, the world is not a friend of God. They're not your friend. They serve our adversary, Satan. He is also referred to in scriptural scripture as the devil. That word there is a word that means accuser. We see that clearly demonstrated in the opening chapters of Job. In other portions of Scripture, he is referred to as a serpent, reminding us of his deceptive ways. By the way, fun fact to know and tell. Ready? Do you know, in school, what is the most devious age in school? What grade? Fifth grade. You would think it's preschool. Ronnie's thinking that because of Lynn's position this year, right? But it's not. The most devious age group are fifth graders. And by the way, it doesn't matter if they're boys or girls. It's the most devious point in time of their life in school. We have a reminder that our enemy, the devil, is one who is deceptive in all of his ways. The Bible refers to him as the father of of lies. We also see in Scripture he is referred to as Apollyon. It means that he is a destroyer. Think about what Satan did the moment he entered into God's creation. God created a beautiful garden, and in it he plants man, and then for man he makes a woman. And there he creates and establishes the home and the beauty of that garden and all that took place, and then enters into the deceiver, Satan, the serpent, what does he do? He destroys. And everywhere he comes, he brings with him a wake of destruction. 
Scripture also refers to him by reputation as one who is the wicked one, reminds us that he is evil in his character. Let's please just keep in mind who our enemy is. Let's please keep in mind that is his design, his desire for you, for me. When he whispers things within your ear to try to get you to remove yourself from the way of righteousness, please remember who that is. He is a liar, a destroyer, one evil to the very character of his life. There is no good that is found in him. He is an accuser, an adversary. In verse 7, we are told of his Rome. There it says, And the Lord said unto him, Whence comest thou? Satan answered and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So the Bible tells us that Satan today is one who roams the earth. He is the God of this world. He goes to and fro. He roams up and down in it. That suggests again his rule. This is his kingdom, so to speak. He is the God of this world. It also reminds us that he is roaming today. Why? Because Peter reminds us he is as a lion walking about seeking whom he may devour to destroy. He is constantly on the prowl and on the prey, looking for his prey, looking to be able to destroy something that is good and that is right and is holy. He roams to and fro throughout the earth. But please understand something. When he came before God, he was no longer roaming to and fro. Why do I say that? He's not omnipresent. He is limited to one place at a time, but he has the ability to move throughout the whole earth, up and down in it. But still, he is limited to his Rome. Then I want you to see with me his reduction. As you listen into the exchange between God and Satan, we find that Satan really has no answer for God. Look at verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, perfect and upright man, one who feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth, God, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Have you blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land? Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath. He will curse thee to your face. God says, have you considered Job? He's a righteous man. He excuse evil. And all that Satan is able to simply do is attack the very motivations of Job. He can't really have an answer as to why Job is this upright individual. But of course, it can only be because he has so many blessings. And you haven't allowed us to bring any trial and tribulation into his life. If you let me just take away that which he has, he will turn his back on you. Now, let me ask you a question. Who started the conversation? God, have you considered Job? I want you to think about that with me for a moment. Why would God ask that question? Well, folks, the reality is God knew the character of this man, Job. And he knew the only thing that Satan could ever point to is if you take away all that he has, If you put a trial into his life, he won't be able to endure. He will turn and curse you. All that he has is the ability to make an accusation against the motives of Job. And in essence, he claims that if God stops rewarding him, there will be no reverence. If you take away the protection, there will be no piety. Consider how important it is then for you and I to walk uprightly. Because what is understandable to you and I 
is although he is no rival to our God, he is a formidable foe for you and for me. And God puts his servant to the test and says to Satan, feel free to touch what he has. Just don't touch Job. Remember his response? Go back over with me to chapter 1 at the end. After having received all the calamities of life, Job rose up, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground. But don't miss the last two words. And worshipped. Verse 21. His worship is found in this statement. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, Naked shall I return thither, the Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. After all of his affliction, Because of the work of the accuser, still Job had faith in God. And that's the last cast of the characters I want you to see with me tonight. And that is God who is the one who is the authority in all of these things. Several things I want you to see about our God in the story of Job. First of all, I want you to see the character of God. When I consider the story of Job, and I consider our God, there really are a couple things that we find and discover. In fact, two names are used of God in this passage and reminds us of who He is. We find, first of all, that He is God. That is the reminder that He is the one who transcends over His creation. He is the one who is sovereign, who is over all. But he is also Lord. And in that it reminds us that he is a personal God, imminent with his creation. So folks, when you and I are going throughout life and we face the trials and tribulations of life, don't forget who it is that you claim to walk with and believe in. He is God. He transcends heaven and earth. He is over all things. Nothing happens without His authority, without His control, without His consent, if I can put it that way. However, He is imminently involved in your life. He is personally aware of what you are going through, and He ministers to you and to me. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is personally involved in the affairs of your life. He tells you, cast all of your care upon Him. Why? Because He cares for you. He says, come and take my yoke upon you. It is light. It is easy. And you will find rest. By the way, a yoke requires two. You're on the one side. Guess who's on the other? It's not your friends. It's not your peers. It's not your parents. It's God. He is the one who is sovereign and He is the one who who oversees in all things. He is Lord. He is personally involved. Not only do we see His character, but we see His control. Again, it's interesting to note that the sons of God came to present themselves to Him. You also see His control in the fact that Satan was bound to obey His commands. It's kind of weird for you and I to consider because we probably don't take much time to think about it. But as God pulls back the curtain of heaven, the angelic host 
came to present themselves to the Lord. They're under His authority. They're under His control. They do as they are told. Satan is told to come. He is given a presence before God. He is accountable to God. And he makes the accusation and God says, you may do this, but you cannot do that. He is required to obey. He does not have the right to go outside of that. He is limited to it. What God says he has to do. God says touch everything that he has. And he did. Every child, every possession. He impacted the way that his wife felt toward him. He impacted his health. Later on, but God said, now you can touch Job, but you have to spare his life. He took him to the brink of death, but he wasn't allowed to kill him. Why? Because God is the one in control. Consider with me his consideration in verse 8 again. Have you considered Job? Think about that for a moment. In order for God to ask that question, it means he had considered Job. He had taken note of his life. Sometimes, folks, God allows you and I to go through the trials for his glory because he's considered your life and mine. And he knows in the end we'll be faithful to him. In all these things, Job did not sin Or accuse God. There's also his contrast. In the question to consider Job, God in essence is saying, Satan, it is true that you have dominion over the earth for a time, but you cannot dominate my servant Job. God's test of Job proves that he is greater than he that is in the world. Remember that verse in 1 John? Greater is he that is in you, the Spirit of God, than he that is in the world. And that spirit lives within you. Oh, the trials and tests of life may come, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When we understand the character of God and the fact that he has considered me and is even willing to put me through this time of testing, this time of entering into a waiting room that I cannot comprehend nor even understand. But in it all, I recognize his care. Notice what Job accuses God of in verse 10. What Job, excuse me, what Satan simply says in verse 10 is this. You have made an hedge about him, about his house, about all that he hath on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. When Satan makes his accusation, he says that God had set a hedge about him. And that's why we can cast our cares upon him, because he cares for you and me. He basically defines God as a God who is a caring God. You have protected him. That really wasn't the reason of his piety. Job understood something of the character of God. He's going to learn more of the character of God throughout this book. But as we've looked at it tonight, I want you to see with me again, just be reminded of the descriptions of those involved in the drama of your life. I want you to understand their motivations. I want you to understand a little bit about their roles. See, you and I sit sometimes in the position of Job, the afflicted. How did we get there? Well, there's a cast of characters around you that you and I don't see because you and I live in the midst of a spiritual battle. See, your life isn't just a physical life, it's also a spiritual life. And there are things taking place around you that you and I sometimes don't give much consideration, but God, in His kindness, has pulled back the curtain of heaven and says to you and to me, please understand that sometimes within the drama of your life, there are other characters involved that you may not be considering nor see. Each one has a role. Each one has a motivation. And it's revealed by their character. 
You look at Satan's description. He's an accuser. He's a destroyer. He's a liar. His motivations toward you are not good. They are intended for evil. By the way, some of the greatest evil that Satan sometimes brings isn't always the trials. Sometimes it's the inflated quote-unquote blessings. See, there are some people that don't handle trials well. There are others who don't handle blessings well. And Satan tempts us, and his desire is to move us away from God. I can think of people in my life that I know who have come into wealth, and the moment they've entered into wealth, they no longer needed God. When things get a little bit good and a whole lot better than what it used to be, see, in the times of their trial, they trusted in God. When things got better, they believed that they had accomplished all of this and therefore they don't need God. And sometimes what Satan brings to us is the inflated blessings of this world and causes us to think how great we are. But folks, in this, God brought a trial to Job's life to prove that there are those who are loyal to him. He is who is God. You say, it doesn't seem fair that Job would have to go through all of that. Do you understand that in the end, God used this to teach Job something more of him that Job would not learn in any other way and then rewarded him for his faithfulness by doubling all that he had blessed him with previously. Ten more kids and twice as many possessions. You say, well, he had ten kids before. How does that a double? He only got ten more. You didn't give him 20. Yes, he did. There's still ten other kids out there. They're just not living. But they were somewhere in eternity. And my guess is they're in glory. Why? Because Job was a man faithful to teach his kids to pray for them and to care for them. But in the, carrot, in the drama of life, you and I have to understand who's involved. The problem is we usually become very self-focused and think this is all about me. Job didn't do that. Job understood it really is about God. It is God who went to Satan and said, have you considered my servant Job? And in the end, in all those things, Job refused to sin against God and foolishly charged him. Instead, he honored him. He worshipped God. All of us will face times and trials and tribulations of life. We've taken a simple overview of the role that God and Satan play in your life And mine. In the couple weeks to come, we're going to go a little bit further and a little bit deeper into those things to consider them. But it's important that you see with me to begin with the cast of characters. You can place yourself sometimes in the position of Job. Please understand there's a motivation of God behind it that when you are tried, you come forth as pure gold. There's a motivation of the devil. That is to destroy your life, your family, and all who follow after you. Never forget the cast of characters in the drama of life. Father, we thank you for this time tonight to be able to take this cursory overview of the book of Job to consider the main characters in his life, the drama that he goes through, and it's a great and tragic story of his life. And yet it's triumphant. When you recognize that in all those things, Job said not and did not charge God foolishly. And God in grace and love, in mercy, meets Job in this book and reveals more of himself to Job. Father, may we not forget when we look at the life of Job, he had no written scripture, he had no Bible. And yet he believed God. 
So Lord, I pray that you would cause us to recognize with all of the blessings that have been bestowed upon us, with the truth in our laps, on our devices, so easily accessible that we would not forget our God and not charge Him foolishly or sin against Him. So Lord, we ask and pray your blessings now in Jesus' name. Amen. Ben? If you would, take your hymnals one more time. Turn with me to hymn 120. <clears throat> hymn 120, the song titled, God Makes No Mistakes. Would you stand with me, please? Again, hymn 120. My life I give to you, O Lord. Use me, I pray. May I glorify your precious name in all I do and say. Let me trust you in the valley dark as well as in the light. Knowing you will always lead me, your will is always right. I know God makes no mistakes. He leads in every path I take along the way that's leading me to home. Though at times my heart would break, there's a purpose in every change he makes that others would see my life and know that God makes no mistakes. And when someday in heaven above I see his dear face, may I then be counted faithful as a runner in this race. Now I'm trusting in the Savior to show me the way. In his righteousness he guides me as I seek to please him day by day. I know God makes no mistakes. He leads in every path I take along the way that's leading me to home. Though at times my heart would break, there's a purpose in every change he makes that others would see my life and know that God makes no mistakes. I trust that as you sang that song tonight, that is really a belief system that you have, that God makes no mistake, even in the difficulties of life, the trials of life that you have been asked to endure, as God has considered you and called you to go through those times, you recognize that he has not made a mistake. He is a God who is holy. He is perfect. He is righteous. He is just. He does not make a mistake in your life or in mine. We've made plenty. God has not. What he has done, he has done with purpose. And what he has done in your life, he has done it so that you would be conformed to the image of his son. He has done all things good and evil in life to bring us to an understanding that he is working it together for good that we be conformed to the image of his dear son. And so when we go through the difficulties of life, let us keep in mind the greatness of our God. But don't forget, there is an enemy who seeks your destruction and mine. Sometimes we don't give that much consideration, but I think it's helpful to do so, so that we understand the cast of characters that are involved in our day-to-day -day lives. So, Father, we ask and pray your blessing upon us as we now go. Give us a good week. May we live to the honor and the glory of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who left the glory of heaven and came to earth. 
He died upon a cruel cross, was buried in the ground, and then he rose again in order that he might conquer sin and conquer death, giving us the victory, giving us access into the very throne room of heaven. And there we can come to find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. He is our great and loving high priest who was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was tested in all points like as we are yet without sin. And he calls us to come boldly unto him, to take upon us his yoke, for it is light, it is easy. He will give us rest. He will care for our souls. Father, we ask and pray that through the trials and tribulations of life, we would not foolishly charge God or sin against him, but instead that we would honor him and worship him because we recognize his character, his care, his consideration of us. Now may we live to the praise and the honor and glory until he comes again. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.